I'd like to welcome everybody to the first episode of our conversations with sports betting industry leaders. Uh, today we have uh, Joseph Solosky, Kevin Twitchell, who are advisors to the board at Data Art, and our special guest is Omer Dor, CEO of Sports IQ. Let's start with uh, some quick introductions here. Um, my name is Russell Karp. I'm uh, an engagement manager at Data Art, focusing on sports betting. And uh, we also have Joseph Solosky, who is an advisor to Data Art. Joseph? Yep, I'm Joe Solosky. I've been advising Data Art on uh, their sports betting practice for the last nine or 10 months now. Um, I've been in the gaming industry for a little over five years. Um, I work three of those internationally um, in the Asian, African, and European market. And I've been working in the US market. Um, for the last two plus years. Excellent. Thanks, Joe. Uh, Kevin? I am Kevin Twitch. I'm also advisor uh, in the media and entertainment practice. And I come more from the media and entertainment business. That was my, my background. But I've been working with Russell, really looking at uh, the sports betting industry from the media and entertainment viewpoint. It's, it's really impressive in the U.S. how much people are spending on the platforms right now, how much time people are spending. And then and, from a technology point of view and from a media and entertainment point of view, I find the, uh, the whole industry very interesting. Yeah. And just as a quick aside, some of the things that you and I have seen as some of the folks from um, the music industry and the media industry in general uh, popping up in the sports betting yes. world here and there. So, <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a lot. I think most of the people in media entertainment industry are looking at sports betting right now as a competition for attention you know, from their, they're taking them from their platforms. So they want to look for ways to work in this, in this arena. So it's really exciting times. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. And, uh, Omer, if you could please introduce yourself. Sure. Um, Omer Dor, I'm the CEO of sports IQ. Uh, we are an odds maker in the sports betting industry, which essentially means that, uh, our company is the mathematical engine that essentially powers um, the types of products that a better would be able to go and place a bet on, whether it's on a digital sport book or a casino, uh, for example, you know, which team is going to win or how many total points are going to be scored. Um, we work in the back end of the industry. Um, we are essentially a supplier to the operators, uh, that provide sports betting, uh, solutions. So that's really interesting. I'm new to to kind of sports IQ. Uh, as you look at yourself in the industry, what's your what's your big differential? And I, and are you considered by some of the traditionalists in the business, the odds maker business, as a disruptor, or or are you being uh, embraced? And and you have a lot of competition right now, also in your space. Listen, I think it's probably a combination of both those things. Um, I, I think by virtue of the fact that we're trying to do things differently, we consider ourselves innovators uh, rather than disruptors. But I certainly think that because of the different elements of what's happening in the industry, specifically on the odds making side, uh, we certainly are disrupting uh, certain things that have been done the same way for, for many, many years. So, you know, if we, if we kind of dig into that a little bit more to your question, how does sports IQ differentiate itself? I think it comes down to three pillars. Um, and some of these things um, really give you an idea of, of the differentiation there. The first thing is automation. Okay, What a lot of people don't know about odds making, especially historically, is that a lot of it was done manually um, by people. You know, and, and that made sense at a different time. As the industry matured and progressed and we moved into uh, more bets being taken in real time during a game that is getting played, uh, as the number of bets increases, as the popularity increased, manual uh, intervention and manual work uh, makes it very, very difficult. And so Sports IQ certainly um, invests heavily in automation and technology that at the end of the day can reduce the costs in comparison to traditional methods of delivering our product um, would be. And I think as a result of that, at the end of the day, it can increase the profitability for our client. And I think that's a, a that's a big differentiating for us in terms of our investments in cloud computing and infrastructure like that. Look, I think the second part to it is customization. And I know it sounds like a simple thing, but it's not. For, for the most part, uh, even today, odds making in our industry is a fairly homogeneous product. And what I mean by that is, you know, 
there's not that much difference uh, if you are a client of supplier A or if you're a client of supplier B or even of the same supplier. Uh, your odds are almost identical uh, across the board. And um, you know, it doesn't sound it doesn't sound crazy, but just imagine going into you know, a restaurant or 10 restaurants and every restaurant you go to, the only thing you can order is a burger and it's the exact same burger, no matter where you go. And I think one of the things that is happening specifically because of sports uh, betting in the U S and the growth is operators are realizing that they can't compete just on marketing dollars. You know, uh, the, the restaurants that have the most amount of money and can spend money on marketing and uh, saying, Hey, come, come buy, you know, a burger here. We'll give you three free burgers before you have to pay for one. If you can't compete on that, you have to compete on product. And so the ability to customize your product in a way that allows you to differentiate, uh, I think at the, end of the, at the end of the day is a huge uh, differentiating element to our clients and therefore to Sports IQ as a, as a, operator, as a supplier to those operators. And then the and last I, thing, sorry, go ahead, Russell. I uh, just uh, wanted to ask it or, or make a comment here. It, it sounds like you know, not only will, um, you know, companies uh, reduce costs, but it sounds like the accuracy uh, will, will also improve. Yeah, look, I, I think accuracy is one element that's important for sure. But there are things, and I don't want to bore your audience by going into tremendous details, but there are things that happen in conjunction with creating models that are equally important. For example, injury reporting, mm. right? Uh, the ability to automate information about, you know, if someone's limping on the field, uh, how should that impact your choice to offer odds or what do the odds look like? And so coming back to that notion of automation and speed and latency, those are important pieces to uh, integrate into your technology infrastructure to ensure that you're providing the best solution. So the models, you know, in that specific example, the accuracy isn't what would cause an increase in profit, but it was the ability to react to information that is happening uh, in real time somewhere. Uh, so all those things kind of play a part to get for sure. Um, and listen, I think the last part to this, um, and we'll probably get more into it as we continue talking about, you know, throughout this uh, chat that we're having is we don't view sports betting as its own industry. I, I mean, it's not just a nice tidbit to say in an interview. It's, I mean, it's, it's just truthful. Uh, one of our core beliefs is that sports betting is just an extension of sports entertainment and fan engagement. And Kevin, you probably understand this coming from the media world, right? I mean, yes. um, and, and to think about it as separate two separate industries is just a wrong thing in our opinion. And so when we think about the products that we build, it's not about what betting products we can build. It's more something from a question of what are sport fans in the United States today engaging in? What are they talking about? Um, exactly. And then how can we have the building blocks from a technology standpoint and modeling standpoint to facilitate betting products that would make them engaged and interested in the sports that they're already consuming? Uh, and so uh, one of the things that we're most known for as a result of that is uh, being a leader in providing player props, which is the ability to bet on the performance of individual athletes. You know, for example, uh, Lamar Jackson played yesterday. How many uh, rushing yards was Lamar going to have? Uh, or how many passing yards is he going to have both before the game starts, but more importantly, as the game is getting played. And what that does is sort of provide a, a full cycle of entertainment where you can engage with sports betting as the game progresses with things that you're already interested in. And so I'd say those are the three things that differentiate us as a, as a supplier that we right. think about things differently. You know, as they say in the media world, everything's two screen now. Everybody's looking at two screens okay. at the same time. So you're participating in the ecosystem of entertainment at all That's times. Exactly it. That's exactly yeah. it. Yeah. Our piece yeah. is to help operators think about um, how can we provide them the tools and the building blocks and the Legos that essentially enable them to create engaging products that, engage in that entertainment uh, in that right. entertaining way. Right. Yeah. Excellent. Omar, I'd be curious to hear um, what, what got you into this industry? What was the impetus or the spark that caused you to kind of want to fill this gap? Um, was it something that you saw in the market overseas? Was it something you saw kind of unique to the U S market or North American market? You know, I don't come from the sports uh, betting industry. I don't come from the media industry. Uh, I actually historically come from healthcare technology. And uh, one of the things that I ended up doing um, was start a private equity search fund, uh, which what, what that means is essentially we looked at acquiring uh, businesses in a specific industry and we did a tremendous amount of evaluation 
uh, about those businesses and those industries. We looked at regulatory things that were shaping the behavior or growth of an industry, uh, what created certain businesses to be successful, competitive advantages. And so that was my background in terms of looking at specific businesses in specific industries. I was just uh, making an introduction between uh, who's our CTO, who had this idea of starting his new company, and one of uh, the investors who invested in that search fund because I knew he was interested in sports betting. And as I was helping him do the due diligence on the industry and the idea of starting this company, just fell in love with it. I mean, I just, with, with what was happening from a regulatory standpoint, with what, uh, how difficult it is to create sport models and knowing that uh, there's only really a few people in the world that can do it as well as uh, ourselves and some other groups are doing it, it became a really interesting thing to get into. Very interesting. Thank you. <clears throat> um, so go going back to the topic of, uh, uh, you know, prop bets specifically, um, mm -hmm. can, can you provide us, and I know we, we've spoken about this offline in the past, but and I, I really like how you uh, shaped this, um, kind of the, the history of, of the prop bets, both from a, a domestic and international perspective. And Yeah, sure. So, yeah. so look, prop bets, uh, some of your audience, the majority of them probably already know this, is just a broad classification of uh, bets that essentially have nothing to do with the final outcome of the game. So final outcome types of bets would be who's going to win, which is known as money line. Uh, what's the spread going to be the difference in points? What's the total points that's going to be scored? All of those things have to actually do with the final outcome of a game. Yeah. Prop bets are all the bets that actually have nothing to do with that. So examples of that would be race to X, who's going to score the first 15 points in a basketball match, or uh, who's going to be the league MVP uh, in the NFL this year, or what colors get a rate going to be in the Super Bowl, like people take bets <laughs> and that kind of stuff. Uh, okay. And I think that, you know, there is variation to that. I think uh, in Europe, uh, where the types of sports were predominantly soccer, horse racing, tennis, golf, um, that, that was one type of prop bets that developed in those sports. But in the U.S., and I, I may be wrong about this, but I think Westgate out of Vegas were one of the first ones to really popularize prop bets. And I think the reason for that, and again, I may be wrong, I have no data to actually prove this, but you know, if you think about the regulatory environment in the U.S., especially in Vegas, it got to a point where uh, you weren't growing uh, by going into additional locations because it was pretty much limited to Vegas. And so you were kind of getting to a plateau with respect to how much betting you were getting uh, in Vegas. And so you weren't going to get growth through territorial expansion. You had to get it through product expansion. And mm -hmm. so the guys at Westgate started coming up with all of these additional prop bets that would become interesting for people to place additional action on while they were watching the games that they were loving to watch anyways. Uh, so I think that was kind of the precipice for how they developed. You know, today, uh, you know, maybe I'm drinking the Kool-Aid, but, um, you know, I think it's fairly well known that uh, one class of prop bets that has become incredibly popular is player props, the ability to bet on those individual athletes like we talked about. In fact, you know, three years ago, no one was talking about this, right? And, and it makes sense. When Passport got repealed, people were just talking about how do I get my sport book live? Today, everyone's talking about what is the next frontier of sports betting and where is it going? And uh, player props is, uh, I think, one of the fastest growing segments within sports betting today. It's interesting about Westgate because if, uh, or personally, if I do a search on future bets, right, Super Bowl odds or, you know, NBA odds, Westgate is usually the first uh, result in a Google search. <laughs> so it actually makes a lot of sense. Yeah, listen, um, rightfully so. Those guys are brilliant. I mean, I think they're known as being some of the original and sharpest, uh, especially for football, for NFL odds makers uh, in the industry. Uh, specifically on pre-match uh, betting. Remember, as we talked about the evolution going into end play, I think that becomes a lot, it's kind of like a different beast, but they really, uh, even today, are known as some of the uh, sharpest minds in our industry, for sure. Yeah. And you know, I have a question, and this one is kind of a little bit uh, out of left field. Um, so, you know, props and kind of more aligned with uh, your typical, you know, uh, sporting events and then sports betting. Um, is there room for props in exchange betting? In terms of like exchanges? Sports yeah. exchanges? Absolutely. Yeah, we think so. I mean, at the end of the day, if you think about it, an exchange is 
just a different way to offer um, betters the ability to place bets on things that they're interested about, right? And exchanges gives you the ability to place the action. I take one action and you're interested in the opposite action. And so we facilitate as the exchange, the ability to transact on that bet. Uh, and so um, I don't think it's the product ex- itself, meaning prop bets that um, is conducive to exchanges. I think exchanges by virtue of what is the most interesting bet to take will be able to facilitate that so for example russell if you are a diehard brady fan and think that he's going to blow it through left field uh you know uh this sunday and he's going to score more than 350 passing yards in this game and i disagree with you then an exchange will allow us to take opposite action to uh to our opinions about what's going to happen this sunday Mm, interesting yeah Yeah, i was i was curious about that because um you know, I, I always aligned, uh, you know, props with closer to sports betting than with exchanges, but uh, totally makes sense. Yeah. 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 It, it's a world that I have to be honest. I don't know enough about uh, exchanges, but, but I do know for a fact that they are certainly facilitating prop betting as part of their uh, products and capabilities. Um, yeah. So I see no reason why they wouldn't. And, and that was inadvertently uh, kind of a segue into <laughs> to my next question is, uh, outside of sports, do you see uh, another universe or universes, universe I, <laughs> um, uh, for, for props? Well, you know, I think that we see it everywhere, right? I mean, um, I don't know if I'd classify them necessarily as prop betting, but um, it, it, we saw bets with the U.S. election recently coming, right? Yeah, Who's going so to win the election? The election the elect, elections had to be a big area. It's a huge part, year. for sure. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. There are groups that focus exclusively on that. In fact, I know that there are operators, uh, what we would or, you know, classify in our industry as sport books, that all the action they take is actually on political betting. So it has nothing to do with sports. And so right. you know, if we use that same analogy about the classification of prop bets, then I would say, you know, who's going to win Florida? Who's going to win Georgia? You know, right. will Trump overturn the Georgia uh, prime? You know, so uh, I think I think all of those uh, would be categorized <laughs> under profits. And so I certainly think that so long as people have interest in something and there is an ability, there's enough data to be able to create uh, engaging products around that, then you can create profits. And I would say in the entertainment world, all the award shows, the Grammys and Emmys exactly. and Tonys, and it could, there's a whole cottage business there. Yeah. yeah, and living overseas, I could tell you, you know, in the European market, there was a lot of interest in 2016 for betting on the U.S. election. Um, I think, you know, Patty Power made a ton of money doing marketing, betting on very, very niche, um, questionably inappropriate. And you can look up the YouTube videos for some of the markets that they were that they were offering. But, you know, they got a lot of attention and they got a lot of um, a lot of interest and made made a lot of money off of it. And to that point. I think one of the highest betting um, events in Europe and certainly the UK is one of those, um, you know, reality singing shows, um, right. something similar yeah. to, the, to the, you know, The Voice or American Idol. Um, it's it's hugely popular. Yeah, interesting, interesting. Yeah, so Super. so kind of going off that tangent, Omer, um, you know, given the the prevalence and popularity of fantasy sports prior to PASPA being repealed and, you know, how, uh, you know, normal and, and culturally acceptable and, and normal it was for fantasy sports to be, um, you know, in, in our society prior to sports betting. I'd be curious to see what similarities that you um, see between fantasy sports and the role that it will play in the future with, with sports betting and specifically um, with, with prop betting. Well, listen, I think there's a couple of things happening there, right? I mean, let's just go back to that uh, underpinning core value or belief, I should say, that we that we have at SportsIQ, which is sports betting and, by extension, fantasy sport is just an extension of fan engagement and fan entertainment. And the growth of fantasy sports in the U.S. pre past that really happened at a time where, uh, from a regulatory standpoint, there, it had to be classified as something different because you couldn't, you know, with the Wire Act and... Uh, betting being prohibited only to, uh, or regulated only in Nevada, um, it was a product form that that was grown uh, in spite of what was happening from a regulatory standpoint, but because people had so much tremendous interest in engaging in sports in a different rate, right? I mean, you guys know this as well as I do, the game within the game, 
right? The tagline. Uh, uh, so the FanDuel's and the DraftKings of the world realize that people are already talking about individual athletes. People are already engaging in it. Uh, they are talking smack to their friends about it every Sunday. Uh, why would we not create a product that allows them to do that in a way that uh, they can place uh, money on it or contest or free to play? And I think that was the evolution of sports, uh, of fantasy sports in the US. Not surprisingly, um, you know, when Passport got repealed, uh, those were two of the, you know, fastest moving operators into the sports betting space because they understood that it's an evolution of that same fan engagement. I think that uh, if you see some of the leaders I'd consider, you know, innovators in fantasy sports today, like Monkey Knife Fight, uh, who you guys probably know about, or Price Pick or Thrive Fantasy. Uh, these are new entrants who are coming to the space, uh, who are classifying under fantasy sports. But again, they're thinking about it more from the perspective of what are the products that would enable people to engage with sports in a different way. Um, and so I, I think that, yeah, it's just two different productization of the same thing fan engagement and fan entertainment. And I think that what we'll see is probably a closer, as PASPA gets, you know, um, I shouldn't say PASPA, but as the regulatory environment increases across the United States to more and more states, you're going to see uh, these two fields come closer and closer with one another, um, where the difference is just going to be one being a contest uh, and one being uh, one where you've been on a daily basis or a weekly basis. Couple of questions though about AI capabilities. Can, can you talk about some of the advantages of having AI capabilities as they, you know, relate to props? Because uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, there there are some sports books that actually um, do this manually, and and we know that you know user error is uh, common across the board. You know, <laughs> with any type of uh, uh, manual intervention. Intervention. Um, so. Can you just talk about how AI capabilities can, sure, or what are the advantages advantages of them? Sure. Um, look, I think you know, unfortunately, we're at a point I think in society where the word AI is becoming a little dilutive, where everyone talks about yeah. the fact that they're using AI and machine learning, and it's too bad because it takes away from uh, uh, the true innovation around it. Um, we do use forms of artificial intelligence and machine learning. At the end of the day, all they are are extensions or branches of mathematics that allow you to do things that were previously more difficult to do. Uh, and you know, uh, the more you use them, I think, the more capabilities you have available to you. So I'll give you an example. We'd like to think that by virtue of uh, modeling individual athletes, the amount of data, well, we know this, the amount of data that we need to account for is significantly uh, more complex than when we model uh, team odds. Okay, because you're getting a lot more granular. And as a result of that, uh, you have to go through many more iterations of modeling uh, in the process. And so one form of our use in utilizing artificial intelligence and machine learning is uh, iterating through many, many iterations of the model much quicker by running, you know, a hundred different versions of the models um, at the same time to assess which model uh, uh, best predicted the final outcomes or, or achieve what we were trying to achieve. That would be a task that would be almost impossible, would take years to do uh, without using that specific branch of uh, machine learning that we utilize. Another example is uh, in player proposition, specifically with NFL, we all know this, weather has a huge impact. Uh, when we model individual players, we started by asking ourselves, well, how do you need to categorize the weather to even begin with? And so, again, um, we can, as a human being, make that determination, but instead use forms of clustering and machine learning algorithms that help uh, cluster these categories for us and then classified players' performance into those categories. And so um, I think artificial intelligence is just an innovation in mathematics, which allows us to do things that were previously very, very difficult to do and probably underpins the importance of the innovation that we have on the modeling side of our business. I, I think that was a great description of what AI is, because as you said, uh, you know, AI and ML, those words are thrown around all over the place, right? Any industry. Mm -hmm. um, and it sounds uh, interesting. It, it sounds kind of like sci-fi stuff. But, you know, if you kind of you know, peel the cover on it, as you said, it, it is just a way to, um, uh, you know, quickly um, model data, right? Um, yeah. How to 
how to yeah how, how to predict results you know based on um, the data that you accumulate. And listen, uh, my data science team and quants team, uh, you know, are probably sitting over there watching this interview, and they're going to hit their head on the wall and saying, "What is this guy talking about? This makes no sense." But you know, uh, as someone who doesn't come from that branch uh, with a very deep understanding, you know, that's the way they explain it to me as a way to understand, you know, the innovation around uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence as a way that's really revolutionizing how we're approaching models. Yeah, and of course, it's it's not as, as simple, and uh, you know, the, your data science guys, uh, you know, they definitely deserve all the credit. Uh, but they do. that's the only way that I can at least understand it. <laughs> <laughs> so. We're in the same boat, Russell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Super. Super. Well, Mark, taking uh, taking the conversation in another direction, I'd be really curious to hear your perspective um, as a supplier. You know, given all of the partnerships that you you know you rely on as a supplier in this ecosystem whether it's with other data suppliers that are already existing platform providers land-based casinos digital sports books are you mm -hmm. concerned about um, you know too much investment too soon or do you think that this product and this profit market is ready to take off uh, so for us specifically I'm not I'm, I'm not concerned about the amount of investment uh, too soon uh, I think we're past that at this point. I mean, I think the question about whether we were cautious about the amount invested was three years ago when we decided to open the the business. This was before PASPA got repealed, so there was no, you know, there was no actual validity to any of the assumptions around the things that we thought were going to happen. You know, now we look in hindsight and we say that's awesome that so many of the things that we said were going to happen actually worked that way. From PASPA getting repealed to, uh, you know, we used to talk about how media is going to come into sports betting. People thought we were crazy. I mean, it was just unheard of until that point, right? Today, you, you see it all over. Um, and so I don't think it's a question of how much was invested or when. I think it's more a matter of execution. Um, and so, you know, let's extend that beyond just the decision that Sports IQ made. I think anyone who's considering investments in sports betting right now, I think it's the right time. You know, people talk about the fact that we're in the first inning or second inning in sports betting in the US. I'm sure you guys have heard uh, people i don't even think we're in spring training i, I think this is like draft night wow. you know and and free agency i like look at what's happening from an MA standpoint in our industry right i mean mm -hmm. operators and supply doesn't matter which part of the industry you're in people are uh either purchasing other suppliers or either becoming more vertically integrated or either coming in and have never been in the industry so i think there's still a lot of movement that's happening in our industry in terms of people getting their pieces together for the beginning of the season um and so yeah, I think this is the, the right time to invest in innovation. And uh, yeah, really, it's the right time to invest in that. Yeah, and I like so I like the spring training analogy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, because, I mean, because if, if you look at if you look at this year as one weird spring training, you know, a lot of games got rained out. <clears throat> and I think the I think the industry as a whole was projecting 2020 to be a bigger year. Right. And Joe, you can you can speak to how how crazy it was all over the map with, with teams going up and down <clears throat> as we come out of our caves, you know, hopefully next year and we're back in stadiums. Does that change the game? Like if you were to put, you know, so you're sitting here in a really weird spring training. You know, if you put your magic ball and start looking at the next year, the next two years, three years, five years, what's it look like? What do you what do you see? How is this going to evolve? In terms of where the sports betting industry is going to go? Yeah, and prop betting in particular, you know, especially here in the U.S. Listen, I think, I think there's two parts to that answer. Okay. I think the first part is um, some people believe that prop bets will uh, become more interesting but remain a niche part of our industry. Um, and I think ourselves included believe that player props and prop betting will become more and more popular because they're more in tune with the uh, possible interests of current and future bettors. You know, I think coming back again uh, to who is going to be bet, you know, pre passed by was a $5 billion industry in the U S I think today, I think at the end of the year, we'll probably do close to 17 or 18 billion in 2020. People are talking about this being 150 billion in uh, five years from now. And when you think about that level of growth, that doesn't happen from people who have bet offshore and are just going to come and flock into legal uh, operators. I think that also comes from people who have never placed a bet in their life. And so it comes back to that same question. 
how are they currently engaging with sports? Well, if they do 100% of their sports entertainment, talking about, um, you know, what player is going to perform the best on this Sunday or uh, which basketball player is going to, you know, shoot it through the ballpark or whatever it is, uh, then that's what they're going to engage from a betting product standpoint. Uh, now, in terms of where the industry is going to go, you know, I'd love to say that, um, you know, I'm, I'm or we are smart enough to predict that. The reality of it is, I think that it's going to be people that may are not even be in the sports betting industry today. It's going to be 17 and 18 and 19 year old uh, kids who are sitting at home and are thinking about, um, you know, who, who could have predicted HQ trivia to be so popular? Who could have predicted, right. Right. you know, Snapchat to be so popular? Uh, in fact, the people who predicted those things are the people who didn't come from the industry. So I think uh, the reality of it is for us as suppliers and operators and people who are in industry is to invest as much as we can in innovation, uh, to be prepared for a time where a new innovation comes in and we can just help facilitate the natural growth of that part of the industry. Um, I think it's going to be fascinating to see where it's going to go. Listen, we also have our own uh, perspective on where it's going and some of the investments that we're making in the company today in terms of productization are, are obviously built in that mind. But long term, uh, I think there's people who are going to shape the look of this industry that we haven't seen. And Kevin, you're coming from media. I think media hasn't yeah. even began to scratch the surface of the role that you're going to play in sports betting. You know? Yeah, and props. You know, I can see TikTok. You know, kids will, the, the, you just talked about the young generation. God only knows what, what could happen on TikTok in the next year Absolutely. in, in your fantasy, sports betting, prop betting. Who knows? Absolutely. It's going to be very exciting. And then when we get back into stadiums, too. I think you know, so. When we're, we're, we're back in watching games live, what's that market going to look like? Absolutely. Absolutely. Think about, you know, we go back to that idea of customized odds, but just think about it as a customized product. I mean, if I am a diehard, you know, Eagles fan, would I not want to interact with betting products that are, you know, related to Eagles in a different way than I would mm -hmm. with, say, the Raptors? Forget about right. the fact that I would may choose not to. I mean, why would I not want a more customized product? Uh, Look, stadiums are doing it today. Season holders get, you know, this beautiful package uh, and customization around the fact it's not just a ticket. Why should betting products not be offered in a similar way? Um, yeah. So, yeah. Omer, speaking, yeah. Of the, speaking of the next few years, um, there's been a lot of chatter recently about, you know, the legalization of sports betting in Canada outside of the pre-match betting that's been allowed. And I'd be curious, you know, from your perspective and given it's your, your home country, um, as, uh, is the talk regarding legalization in Canada an opportunity for Sports IQ to grow there in terms of offering player props in, in Canada? Yeah, listen, I think that um, we are geography agnostic. I mean, it's the truth, right? Uh, wherever It just happens to be that the Canadian sport fan follows the exact same leagues and sports that the American sport fan follows. Maybe there's some slight differences in terms of our preference for hockey versus the American preference for football, but... You know, we watch the same college basketball and football and uh, baseball games that the American better watches. So, um, yeah, I think that Canada is going to be uh, a market that will come up. I think, you know, I recently heard that Ontario, uh, if they were a U.S. state, would be the fifth largest U.S. state, right? And oh. so I, I think that there is certainly a massive opportunity in Canada. And I think it's also a natural progression, not just for us as a supplier, but for operators and everyone that's coming in because the similarities are so similar. You know, mm -hmm. in, in relationship to say when Passport got repealed and you had all these operator and suppliers coming from Europe, which in my opinion is a significantly different market just because of the sport fan. Mm -hmm. So that's it for our first episode. Uh, we want to thank our guest, Omar Dor uh, from Sports IQ for joining us today. And thank our advisors from Data Art. Joe and Kevin. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot for having me. Thanks for having Appreciate us. It. Thanks, Omer. Thanks.